Hello, I'm William Gallagher and this is 58 Keys, which as ever, as always, is for writers like you and me who write on Macs and iPhones and iPads. Uh, do subscribe because there's so much to talk about, but today do subscribe and get biscuits because this is a 58 Keys special. It is a three biscuit guide to Scrivener, a deep dive into this one excellent writing app. And in the, these three biscuit guides, we take as much time as it takes. I'm actually building up a playlist of three biscuit guys so that you and I have a kind of resource to dip into when we come to use an app. If you can think of a writing app that you would really like, a, a truly comprehensive guide to, and one that you think I'll know well enough to help you, uh, then, well, that is exactly what the entire YouTube comment system was designed for. But for now, Scrivener is this quite amazing app for writers, so here's how to use, get the most out of, exploit Scrivener on the Mac and on the iPad. So this is Scrivener on the Mac, and actually we're going to concentrate on the Mac for most of this three biscuit guide. Most of it because most of it's exactly the same on the Mac and the iPad, and it's actually just a little handier, a little easier to show you on the Mac. There are little differences, some of them nothing very important, some of them quite handy actually on the iPad. So we'll swap to the iPad to show this, but I'll kind of bunch those together towards the end. Um, most of the processes are the same, so let's go through most of the processes. This is the opening screen of um, Scrivener on the Mac and recent documents, templates, you see all of this. And one thing you don't see there that actually we need to talk about right away. Two seconds in and already we have to stop talking about something that's important and not necessarily obvious. This thing when you go into uh, Scrivener and you create a new document, well, of course you would, it's a, it's a writing app, you're gonna create a document, you're gonna write in it, but then you're going to save it and where you save it is important. You are kind of encouraged in Scrivener to save to a Dropbox folder. You need a Dropbox account to do that. If you go to dropbox.com and sign up, you can get a free account there with a certain amount of space. Uh, it's not very much space, but it's more than enough for a book or several books, really. Do that and Dropbox, it creates a folder on your Mac or a section on your iPad for Dropbox stuff. Save everything to there. When you do that, this makes it much, much easier and safer to use Scrivener on several devices. Now, I suppose actually, if you knew for certain you were only ever going to use Scrivener on your iPad or on your Mac or on your iPhone, then you could just save it wherever it happens to go and not really worry about it. But the odds are, particularly because of that bit that you can do this on your iPhone as well, you are going to want to edit on a second device now or at some point. Start by assuming that you will save your books to this Dropbox folder. Uh, you, you'll see why as we go through that there are lots of bits in a Scrivener folder. It looks to us like it's one book, but it has lots of bits in it. When you save it to Dropbox, all of those bits are available on all of your devices, but only if you close the Scrivener document. So uh, when you finish for the day or when you finish for lunch, actually, any time you're going to go away from your book, close it in Scrivener, let it save to Dropbox, let it do its doings, and then come back later and open it up on the same device, on another device, whatever. Because if you don't, what is definitely going to happen is you will leave it on your screen thinking, ah, I'll come back to this tomorrow. And before you come back to it tomorrow, you'll open up the same book on another device and it won't have saved properly. And Scrivener is actually really good at warning you about this, at just giving you solutions to it, but it's an impossible problem, really. It is a bewildering, confusing mess of what's where, what's the new version, and bits of your book will be updated. It's just, it's horrible. So just don't, I mean, you're gonna do it. If you're gonna do it, do it quickly. See how horrible it is. Move on. Um, write your book in Scrivener on any device you like every device you like, but every time you finish, every time you pause, just close it, okay? Yes, you can tell this has happened to me. Back to the Mac here, let's go through these templates here. Well, no, I'm not actually gonna go through these templates here because I only ever use that one. I only ever use the blank one. I know if you go into fiction, well, look, you can see things that are set up for novels and stuff. It's the layout of it, the default styles and things, and I don't really care about that because in my case, what I'm interested in is the text, 
So I go in and I write the text. I use all of Scrivener's editing tools, organizational tools. I don't tend to use much of the formatting ones. And when I do, I kind of worry about it later and impose them, put them on, work through them. It's more efficient to start out with a template that matches what you're going to do, but ah, I never do. So let's just go for blank. I'm gonna create this. And just give it a... I did one earlier to practice. Let's just bring that where you can see it. This is the default blank Scrivener document. It's kind of divided into three bits, most of which I think you recognize. The big white bit here, well, that's where you write. And that's the bit you know about. You know, I think you can handle the writing side of it. Uh, above it, um, a toolbar with tools, a lot of which we'll come to as we go through the, the guide. But really, it's, doesn't every writing app have a toolbar? A lot of options there with fonts and things and justification. And down here, this section here begins draft, ends trash, it's called the binder. And it's one of the most useful parts. It's defining parts of Scrivener. I'm not actually very, very keen on this minimalist view. Kind of am, kind of not. I like to concentrate on the writing, but I find if we add just one little thing, it's handier. And that little thing is over here. It's this eye for information. If I tap that. Oops, excuse me, if I tap it there. Now, I just get this extra pain here with some options that we are going to come to. I tend to have that open when I'm working on things. It helps me with planning more than writing, but it helps me a lot. And also, once I switched it on, I kind of forgot to switch it off. So, got a bit used to it. Tell you what, actually, rather than a blank document complete from scratch, let me show you the thing I'm working on at the moment. If I go for this and open Recent, this is a book on how writers and authors can interview people. Uh, so here's a pile of chapters and things, and doesn't it look much the same? There's some text already written. This binder that I'm going to tell you more about has all of these things in it. Uh, the toolbar has a bit of information. Well, you hover over there, you get word count, and there's some details around here that I'm not actually that fussed about. I'm going to click that, and that's what you saw a moment ago in the blank one. That's what I have open most of the time. If I want to, I can now just start writing. And that's the thing with Scrivener, you can just start writing, start writing and stop. That's it. You don't have to delve much. You don't have to learn much for it. You, you use what you need and you write what you need and then you add more. But typically the kind of things you're going to add more are in here in the binder. There are three sections here. I mean, trash. Oops. That was from my previous attempt when I practiced. You don't want to see that yet. Uh, research incredibly useful and we will come to this the draft is your book okay draft is a book and here are the chapters in it and let's say i want to add a new chapter there's a plus sign it's getting difficult now isn't it uh, there we go i have added a chapter it's put it down here and it's not really where i want it so i'll just pop it up under there. And now my last chapter is chapter 99, whatever. There are other things you can add. And I don't tend to do this, but you might. If you have a book that's divided into uh, parts or volumes, well, then you can add a folder instead. You can make a folder with part one and then within it, put your chapters if you like. I'm going to delete that because this is a real book and I don't want to, you know, next month I'm going to come into this thinking, what was that for? Did I forget anything? Move to trash. You'll never guess where it's gone. There it is. Uh, something to note, you saw me there. I created a new document. It went in where I wasn't expecting and I dragged it to a new place. You can drag any of them around. As it happens, please don't let me forget the sequence of these chapters because they are in the right order. But let's say this one, for some reason, I think you can find people after you've interviewed them rather than before. I can put it at the end if I like. I can change anything like that. It was there, wasn't it? Also, you see there's a tiny little icon. That little thing there next to finding people and all of these, that says that's just a text document. There are options where you can change that to be, uh, well, all sorts of things. I don't even know what all of these are, but that's up to you whether you use them or not. I tend to not think about it at all. 
having got all of these chapters in order, I can just keep adding things. And that tends to be the way I like to do it. I like to just write, add the next chapter, write and so on. You can, however, uh, do several at a time. So I could do uh, chapter 99. Well, hang on, let's put that just where I was a moment ago. Put that at the end and follow it immediately by, or I'll spell it right later. No, actually I'll spell it right now. Click and wiggle. You can just keep creating loads and loads of chapters like that. In any one of them, click start writing. No limits, nothing, uh, no constraints, no further setup you have to do. Styles are things you can do. You can add in, you can make something a heading, you can make things just be bold or italic or anything like that. But really, you set up a new chapter, you start writing. However, take a look at what's going on on the side here. Synopsis and notes. Notes, for example, uh, only you and I will ever see that. Actually, no, only I will ever see that normally. Notes, uh, corrections, edits, anything I want to put in there that I need to remember but doesn't go in the book itself, in the chapter itself, I can pop up in there. And also, you see under here, chapter, actually, I'm going to go up to uh, a chapter that's actually got some text in it. Give me this. Okay, here's an introduction to the book. There is nothing written under this bit here. Synopsis, chapter name, nothing. Okay. But look up here. So we do work through the toolbar. Here's a tool that's useful. This is the cork board. Nothing appeared there at first because I was only I'd selected one section, and this is meant to be for showing you a range of things. So I needed to click back up on the top on the draft to see all of them. But now having done that, if I tap on the card. This is supposed to be like those things where you would have an actual board made of cork and index cards for each chapter and you'd pin them and you'd move them around, which I've never done, but people do. Uh, this is the nearest analog, uh, digital version of that analog thing. And just as with those, I can take the introduction and I can put it down there. I can move it around. Notice, by the way, when you do that, the introduction is moved down there. If I move it back, have a look again and see what happens. It goes back to where it should be. But also, look over here, still no text. This is the same as you saw when we were actually in that text document. You can make the same notes. I'm going to kill that one. You'll see it later. It's gone again. But here on this corkboard, what's written there are the opening lines of the text page. And a lot of times that's useful, but let's say uh, guide to who this book is for. That text I've just written there now appears here, and I would argue that that's actually easier for me to look at and see that it's what I need. You can add that to all of these. You can add it to none of them. That is only for you. That only appears here. Let me get into the text itself, though, because this is where you're going to spend most of your time. When you're writing, I think you spend most of your time in here, in text. Of course you do. But then often when I'm writing, I need to compare things. So um, I had this book once I was doing, uh, worked out about 150,000 words of books, nonfiction thing about a TV show. And uh, I think there were 40 or 50 interviews in it, but it was really difficult to get all the people. And even though there was an obvious structure to the book, you followed the series through its life. There were some people who were involved at the start that I could only speak to towards the end. Uh, people the other way around as well. I got the interviews in all sorts of orders. And before I could approach them, I really had to be clear what my order was. But also then when it came to this stage, I'd interviewed them, I'd got the information and I was writing it. I might quote an actor in chapter 10 and then later be writing chapter two and something he or she said turned out to be relevant for there and I put it in and it suddenly occurred to me part way through which is the first occurrence of that actor when you're the reader for me it was chapter 10 so I introduced the actor in chapter 10 but now here he or she is in chapter one which, but that's where the re I need to put the intro first so what I would do is I would search for all the references to this actor and I would read them all together and try to see 
what comes first, what's the best place to introduce who. And this is one of the ways I do it. If you look here, you see introduction is highlighted. This is all of the text for my introduction. There's a nice little word count down below. If I instead go to here, well, this is the next chapter on approaching people and so on and so on. But I can do this, hit the draft at the top and, excuse me, switch back from corkboard to this view, the sub scrivenings. I love this word. This is all of the text of the book in sequence. No chapter markers, nothing. Also, by the way, total word count. I'm not very far into this by the look of it. But then I can do this. And this was what was golden for doing that comparing of actors and introductions. Uh, let's say I know I mentioned the actor in approaching people and immediately after the interview. I just held down the command key and selected two chapters. And now this screen, this text, is those two chapters, one after another, and a word count showing them both together. I could read that and see, I could compare different parts of the book. I know a lot of novelists do this when they're trying to follow a character through. I tend to do it more with non-fiction when I'm doing this kind of out of sequence juggling and things. But it's also deeply handy for anything where you want to get, just get rid of everything except the chapters you're working on. And frankly, let's see Microsoft Word try to do that. Okay. Let me just go back to having one document here. Let's say the introduction, um, it, it, it's a guide to what this book is about and who it's for. I kind of want to keep that in my mind. I don't really, but let's say I want to keep that in my mind uh, throughout the writing of the book. Actually, when you're writing a book, you do know what it's about, but there are things like this you need to keep remembering or that you need to refer to. Let me take this introduction and drag it over to this icon here. And now if I click on that icon, it's like a bookmark to that section of the book and any time I want I can just go straight to it and read that. And what's more, I can read it as a separate window. So if I'm referring to two chapters at the same time, that one with the actors and things, well, as it happens, I read one, then immediately read the other, but I could have had them side by side and worked through this way. Or actually, I could work it through this way. Look down here. This is like a, it's kind of, well, it's called toggle split, but it looks to me like a double page spread of a book. If I click on there, if I click on there, right, I have two windows here open with exactly the same text, but if I choose, conducting the interview for whatever reason, one of them changes to that and the other one stays where it is. You get why that's useful. isn't it? And then to get rid of it, you check this icon has changed to a single document, get rid of that and you're back in the one that you were, you've chosen to write in there, the one that appeared on the left. If you like. That could be all you need to know. You just create a chapter, you write, you create another chapter, you write, occasionally you refer, maybe you bookmark, and you just carry on and on. Except there are different views of this. You've actually seen one of these. You've seen two of them, in fact. Let's go to the draft so you get everything. This is the scrivenings view. I never use that word, and I really like that word. This is the view of the complete text. Yeah, and you've seen the corkboard, which you can adjust and change. There's also this. It's kind of an outline. In fact, let's just see what Scrivener calls it. Sub-documents in the outliner. Yeah, I suppose it's an outline, kind of. I don't think you can do inserts. Oh, you can, a little bit. You can tell I never do. I tend to use Omni Outliner for complex outlining and things, but you can adjust things here. What I find this section more useful for occasionally is all this stuff here. Next to each chapter, I can say, I can give it a, a you know, red for important, green for finished. I can go anything I like like that. Or I can use the status. Still got it left to do. It's done and various steps in between. I can edit to add more. I can do that. I have done that. It tends to be a bit more detail than I tend to want when I'm writing something. Usually it's a case of I'm just writing it to get it out first and then I'm editing through and things. Uh, there are times though when that is really useful to be able to just see, yeah, this is the last section of the book I need to do something to. That's quite a nice moment and you can see it with that. Most of the time though, I'm in one 
chapter at a time. Normally, like I say, I'm writing, okay, because we're writers, that's what we do. I write and then I add another chapter and I write. At some point, I go back and edit and edit and edit and edit, okay. But as much as editing improves everything, you know sometimes an edit didn't work out. You've written a section, um, maybe this is more common in novels than non-fiction, but you went off down a certain road and no, it didn't work. So you kind of back up, you delete everything, you start down the right road, hopefully, or just the next one, and part way down you're thinking, well, this is better, but there was that really good bit in the other one. I could use that here. Scrivener actually has a way of helping you with this, and it's a feature called Snapshots. A snapshot is a flash, flash grab, smash grab, camera-like thing. Well, they use the camera icon for it. It's a grab of everything in that chapter as it is right now. To do a snapshot, let me show you what happens. You, uh, this is an options thing here. You need to make sure the eye is open for information. Another reason to have it open always. Look through here and this camera icon here. Snapshots, if I just do a plus, there. This is, this text scrolling here is all of that text exactly as it is right now. But, oh please let this work, I'm going to delete everything. Okay, I think that worked. This is my new, really, really short chapter, but here is the rest of it exactly as it was. Now, just forgive me because this is a real project, I'm going to undo that to put it back. Yep, that worked. Um, I did that but just Command Z because I'd instantly decided, no, I want these things back. But you're further down the line, normally. You've written something else, usually, and maybe you want to step all the way back. Maybe you know you want to grab things. I could, for example, call up this snapshot by, again, just focusing on there, I button, then snapshot. Here's a list of everything we've got, date and time of when it happened. I can say, actually, that line is really key and I can just copy it, paste it into the book, do what I like with it. Or there's a roll back button. I was going to say if we click that, let's click that. Roll back replaces everything in your chapter with everything in the snapshot. Uh, the current chapter gone, the old snapshot back in. This of course means you've just lost everything you've just done that's new. Scrivener is somewhat aware of this, warned you of it, and it actually offers to take a snapshot for you of the new version before you swap it back. So let's say yes. And now, um, you can't tell because the text is the same, but this main body of text, that's all changed, it's become all of this, but the, the newer text I've just deleted is in fact there. You can build up as many snapshots as you like, and I could rename this to Really good, but not, or something like that. I could put something in there like a uh, first draft completed. I uh, might put in there first draft before editor sees it. I could, you can put anything you like in it. The purpose there is to be able to see which one is which if you want to step back into any of them. The snapshots feature. I, I find I should use it more, but when I do use it, it is deeply useful. And the thing of all of this is it's all in the one place, isn't it? This this is one of the things I like about this compared to Word. With Microsoft Word, if I wanted to do this, what would I have to do? I'd take my documents, I'd do file, save as, and I keep a new copy somewhere else with, or a new copy, a copy of the old text, and then I'd carry on writing. And look at me, I've already just got confused explaining it to you. I know I have done, ended up with folders full of odd chapters, and I suppose you can sort them by date, and things but you never do and it's just really difficult to manage whereas this uh, I think the company Literature and Latte makes it describes it as a writing environment more than a word processor it keeps everything together for you and lets you do these kinds of things without the usual confusion that a normal word processor might give you I just said it's very good for as a, an environment that helps you, really I'm saying it helps you with all of your writing. And obviously a key part of writing is research. For non-fiction, what else is there but research really? But even in fiction, 
you're building up images of places, of settings, of characters. You're compiling research in all sorts of ways and manners that's probably unique to you as a writer, but is definitely needed for your writing. All of it, whatever it is, can go in here. Let me get rid of the trash again so we can concentrate on this. Actually, let me get rid of the draft as well. The section here, research. Uh, original script draft. Now, this, this book, as I say, it's a real project. It began as a, a very extensive video course that I wrote a script for, and I've been slowly converting the script into a book form. So I just chucked in the original script there, and I go back to it to check, make sure I'm covering the same things, make sure I've got the same detail. It's The book's expanded, but it starts with the script. Okay. Uh, times table, I don't even know why that's there. I think that's from a previous example, and yes, it is. Let me give you another previous example. Uh, I'm going to open up a website. Um, this is a script I'm reading. <coughs> script to the new uh, series of the 4400. If I click in here and I drag that into research, this is great. An, I may not have done a great example there because this is actually a PDF isn't it? But there it is. I was going to drag you in a PDF, in fact, actually. I've got PDF here. Uh, um, PDF. Right, that's actually a script of mine that came straight from PDF. That's a PDF. That's a PDF on a website. That's far too confusing. What can we do as a website? Uh, BBC News. Grab that in there. And that grabs the entire website as it is right now. So you build up your search there. You've written, actually, I tell you what, since we're doing this, let's do it more. And um, what have we got so far? That's a script draft that was actually a Scrivener document. That's a website. That's a PDF that's on a website. That's a PDF. That's a proper decent website. Let's have a look at, uh, this is a radio appearance I made. So let's go up there. That's uh, audio from a BBC radio interview I did. Or how about this? Let's add that. This is a screen recording I made. I said that I've done a previous version. It's working through just checking that I was going to cover what I wanted to tell you about. This is a recording of some of that. Um, anything else? Nope. I think that's it. So what have we got? We have a video. We have a website. We have audio, PDF from a website, PDF. And that's uh, another website. And this is the original draft of my script. There is nothing that can't be dragged into Scrivener on the Mac. It is slightly more involved on the iPad. You have to import it. So rather than just being able to drag things, you click an import button, you select what it is. It's not actually as good on the iPad. It's one of the few things that's not as good on the iPad as on the Mac. But in either case, you can have all of your search in this one place. And two things about that. One is, it's everywhere. Open this one Scrivener document on your Mac, on your iPad, on your iPhone, anywhere at all, and you get your text, you get all of the research. And it's also nowhere. This is the draft up here. This is the text, everything from draft down to research. That's what a reader will ultimately see of this. They do not see anything of this. I could change that, I mean, what's that one? That one is actual writing. I could pop that up in there if I wanted. But I don't have to, and I'm not going to. I keep it building up in the research thing. I, this is how it, it's actually it's one of the reasons why that syncing thing is important. The business of the fact that Scrivener has to be, um, you make sure you close it. It's because there are lots of these little bits and things, and they all. It's one Scrivener document with loads, potentially hundreds of little bits in it, and they have to be all copied over between machines. And it's done automatically, but you can break it by opening up the document and couple of places at the same time and things like that. This is like a suitcase of your writing, the way I see it. I could, I'm talking to you at my Mac in my office. I have an iPad right in front of me. When I finish here, I can close my Scrivener document, take the iPad away with me, open it up on there if there's an internet connection where I'm going. Or if I know there isn't, I can open it up on the uh, iPad right here in my office, then close the iPad, take it off to me and work anywhere. So you're off on a writing retreat with no internet connection. You've gone into a library where you don't have the Wi-Fi password. You just, you're in a coffee shop, anything you can think of. You open your document, you've still got everything. 
And again, compare that to something like Word or Pages, which as good as they are in so many things, they're not good for handling and organizing and manipulating lots of research the way Scrivener just does so readily and so well. How can I say this so that it doesn't sound like I'm trying to put off, put off postpone the last section about compiling? I will give that away now. There are a couple of things I want to tell you about. Uh, one in a moment is the differences with the iPad. Again, they're small, but they're significant. Uh, there are also other things I want to show you, like little extras for it. But there's one major area of Scrivener that I promise you, I did, I've used Scrivener so much and I did not know for years that this was here. It's script writing. Everything you've seen so far, you, I've talked a lot about nonfiction, but you can see equally how it's done with novels. Script writing is different. Scrivener can handle script writing. And with some constraints, some limitations, it handles it really, really well. So let's start by making up a script. You remember right at the start when we had the templates, you open up uh, Scrivener and there's that box that says, what do you want? You pick a template and I always go for blank. There is a script writing one there. If you go into that script writing one, it offers you templates for different types of things, radio, film, TV, and things. I've only ever gone into the film one because that uh, works for film and it also works for all good television all good hour-long television or longer. Uh, Half-hour sitcoms have their own format and for reasons. There's a BBC TV format which is just ugly as anything because it's based on a 1950s studio thing where the cameras matted more than the people. So it's all camera directions and tiny bit of writing. Absolutely horrible. You don't want to go anywhere near that. Film works for most places and film is, is the right kind of script writing. When I read scripts, I read scripts every day that's the one I want and Scrivener is very good at it. So let me use this then. I've just said you can open a template and start from scratch but right in the middle of a document you can also do it as well. You can switch. The default is prose and text. I want it to be script writing and I can do it a couple of ways. I can hold down the command key and tap the number eight. Row mode, standard text mode. Not really sure how you're supposed to remember number eight except I obviously do. Uh, if you don't remember number eight, well, here you are in Scrivener. You can go over here to Format, Script Writing, Script Mode. And one thing to note is this is a toggle. If you choose this, you're in Script Writing Mode. And if you choose it again, you can go back and you can untick it and you're out of Script Writing Mode. And equally, this Command 8 takes you in, takes you out. I don't think you're very likely to mix script with prose, but you could, and this is how you would do it. Um, I'm gonna, in fact, in my prose book, there is now going to be a script chapter, and I honestly can't remember if I'm in script mode or not. Yes, I am. Once I'm in script writing mode, hit the return key, and these are kind of typical script elements that you'd have in Final Draft in, uh, is it Celtex or Celtex? I never remember. Highland 2, all sorts of things that are professional script writing apps. They're in um, Scrivener as well. Um, and also, let's just choose one. So, int. Uh, all scenes being within Torex, it's offering me that. I can just select that one and. Here we are, um, tab key is kind of daytime, let's do that. You see I tried to complete day. Here's some, excuse me, I've got my caps lock on. Anyway, so action and things. I can also go around to character. You're in my scripts now. And so through. You saw how quickly it went there. I tabbed to get to the character names. I hit return. It offered me things. Uh, usually, if I hit, uh, do a character, when I hit return, it's expecting me to write things that I'm going to say. And that's it. However, if I enter you, uh, another character name, and then hit the tab key, we get these square brackets, these parentheticals. That's, yeah. I call them Rileys up above, that's what they're known as sort of dismissively because so many writers just put Riley in there. 
this is a script really isn't it and I mean maybe there are other options we haven't talked about transitions cut to I don't tend to use that much shot I don't I tend to leave that to director I might guide them by showing, um, describing it in such a way that we know we mean medium close-up, extreme close-up, but long shot. I don't bother putting those terms in. And I have no idea what general text and general text is. In fact, when I say to you general text, I want to do that kind of thing. These are the ones we just looked at. These are the ones we use most of. These are the ones Scrivener is excellent at. Now, I think this may have changed. A long time ago, some years ago now, I interviewed the developer of this at the company Literature and Latte, mentioned that I just found the screenwriting and he was enthused about it, as you would expect to be since he developed it. But one thing he cautioned me, he said he felt that Scrivener's script writing was best for like a first go, a first pass, a first draft, really, of a script. And that after that, if you're going to be working on it more, you should really send it off to an app like Final Draft or Fade In or Celtex, Caltex. Um, I see his point and I liked the fact that uh, he wasn't trying to say my app does everything, but actually in this case, I'm pretty sure he was wrong because I have done a complete script in Scrivener and I like it, I think it's fine. I can't remember if I even did pass it on to anywhere else. Um, maybe when he went to a production company or a producer or something, I had to think about that. But for my writing, our working on this text, Scrivener was more than fine, except for one thing. And this is probably just me, but you see this thing here with the pros, I've divided it into chapters. And I really like the fact that I can click on that chapter and just be concentrating on it. I made a note to myself that I'll make it into two chapters. Fine, I'll make it into two chapters. I concentrate on this and only this. Books, scripts, they're big projects. This helps us just focus on the thing we want. And I do that by adding a new chapter and then writing and a new chapter and then writing. With a script, well, you can do this. You probably should do this. And yet I don't. Um, that is a new script, a uh, new scheme rather. And I could have made it a new chapter. I suppose I still could. I could select that. I could add a chapter. I could paste it in and now I can look at the first scene, I can look at the second, but frankly I never do. Maybe it is just because scripts tend to have short scenes, but I'm, I'm definitely I'm in the moment. I've got the characters arguing in my head. Um, I write one scene and I keep going. I don't tend to do that. I don't tend to split it in and, and you don't have to. Why should you if you don't want to? Except that splitting and that ability to focus on things I argue that it's actually probably more useful in scripts than anywhere else because how you very often want to see scenes 1, 17 and 39, one after another or side by side. That's how you would do it in Scrivener, that's how you should do it in Scrivener and just because of the way I write, I tend to switch off that organisational ability of Scrivener and saying it to you now I realise actually that's a criticism of me rather than of Scrivener. These things adapt to how you work. I think you'll find Scrivener is great for you because it's so very good at so very many things. But there are going to be bits you never do, there are going to be bits you never exploit. And for me, script writing, this element of script writing is one of them. I have Final Draft, I like Final Draft, so I write in that. I've done it in Scrivener and been very happy with it, but it almost felt like I was trying to make Scrivener into Final Draft. I was ignoring the benefits of Scrivener, and what's the point of that? You've got it, you should use it, and this is a great part of it. Now, um, so differences with the iPad. I mean, that's, in some ways there are a lot, because it's a very different device. Scrivener was rewritten for it completely, but really it does all the same things in pretty much all the same ways. It's just sometimes, because the screen differences, controls are in a different place, and there are a couple of things that are just slightly different. Some better, actually. This is what, happened, this is what you see when you open Scrivener on your iPad. Um, this is very similar to the Mac one in purpose, just looks different. It's a list of all your recent, or for, in my case, ever, books opened up and written in Scrivener. But actually, speaking of that, I have too many here. You know this business that uh, you get a Dropbox account, you get a certain amount of space, and you should close your document and let it save there. Another part of that is that you shouldn't put too many books 
you know, I mean, some of those, they're dated, I can see 2018 in the dates there, that they're long finished and gone. When they're gone, move them out of the Scrivener Dropbox folder and archive them off somewhere else on your Mac or on your iPad. Keep the list of books here in this section down to as few as you can for this reason. That thing about syncing of whether things are up to date or not. Your iPad will look at every single one of these books and see, is it up to date? Is the copy on Dropbox the same? Is it match? And when you've got a lot like this, and when you've got a slow internet connection, as I quite often do, that takes enough time to be really annoying. Enough time that it stops you opening the book to just make a quick change and things. It's tedious enough that it's, you think, well, I'll just save it up till I've got more to do, and then you don't do it. So uh, cut it down to just a few you wanted, but in fact, actually, I'll do that. When we're done here, thank you for the reminder. I will go clear out some of these older ones. But for now, let's go back into the book we've already been looking at on the Mac. Just we'll do it here on the iPad. We go into it and you see it's very similar. It's just not showing you everything in one go. Uh, the text is there. There's all of the text in that main area. And there's that binder down the side with uh, the draft, the research, the, the trash, even all those useful things for it. Just as you can on the iPad, excuse me, on the Mac, you can obviously add a new chapter. The difference is instead of a plus sign at the top, it's a plus sign at the bottom. And there's a really nice little, little alteration here. On the iPad, when you tap on the plus sign to create a new chapter or a new section in the book, you don't, you don't just add it into the binder the way you do on the Mac. You add it into the binder, but it comes up with this pane showing you some options to fill out. Uh, the chapter title. You can write it there. The synopsis. You could put the synopsis in here if you like. But then the thing that matters to me is up here in the corner. There's the add and the open button. If you press open, a new chapter is created in the binder in your book and you're in it and you can just start writing. And most of the time that's what I do. But if instead you tap add, well, that chapter is created, but you're not taken into it. You're ready to do another one. So you see how I added, was it chapter 99, 100, 101, until like that. If I'd set out to do that, I could open up on the iPad, create chapter 99, tap add, create chapter 100, add 101, 102, and so on. I have done this. Uh, I'm really clear in nonfiction sometimes that something's going to take three chapters to do it, so I might create the three in one go and then just go into later. If you're more disciplined, if you're more of a planner than maybe I am, then you might... You might have an outline of 30 chapters and you could add, add, add 30 of them in one go and go in and add as you need. It's a tiny difference, but actually I think it's a really good thing on the iPad. Next, uh, overall changes on the iPad, uh, the, the, the script writing one. I honestly think this is why I didn't realise for years that there was a script writing option at all, because I, I think I tend to write most on the iPad. I go off into a quiet corner with the iPad and I write in Scrivener there. And on the iPad, even though script writing is there, it's slightly less in your face. On the Mac, script writing is right there in the opening screen. There's a templates for it. Uh, when you go into Documents, okay, it's not obvious, but it's there under the menus. In the iPad's case, you have to first tap on the systems little cog icon in the bottom corner. And then you tap on a um, section called uh, Editor. I think it's, yeah, Editor, there it is. Tap on Editor, and then you tap to toggle on Allow Script Writing. Just as with the Mac, though, this is a toggle. So when you're done with script writing, you want to go back to writing regular prose, you go back in Settings, Cog Icon, tap the Editor, toggle off Allow Script Editing. Now, there are some other small differences uh, with the iPad, but those are the main kind of ones. Uh, I'll point out a couple more on the way. We have a thing like uh, the word count. On the Mac, you've already seen this actually, there is the word count, and that's for that chapter. If I tick on that chapter, there's the word count. Click on the draft. Oops, I'm in ally mode there from earlier, back to the scrivenings, and that, you know. Oh, because I'm still in, uh, Script writing mode. I wonder what was going wrong there. There I am. That did draft. That's the word count for them all. And again, I think I love pick two chapters, get the word count for the lot. Fine. 
there do, you might know that if you know this and, and I just don't, please tell me in the comments, but there doesn't appear to be a certainly not an obvious way to get a word count for, say, chapters 1 and 13 together. Chapter 1, yes. Chapter 13, yes. The whole book, yes, but not 1 and 13 the way you can on the Mac. I don't know that I care that much. It's the ability to edit them that I want more than the word count, but that would be a nice ability to have. To get the whole count, by the way, you tap on any one of the chapters, you get sort of, you see this footer that appears in the way it's kind of toolbar footer. Tap in the middle to dismiss that if it comes up in your face. And down there, there's the word count for that chapter. Tap on that. And now you get a section that includes a section, uh, that includes a count for the entire book. And it includes a target, um, a word count target. It seems to me that on the iPad, this is it's kind of designed to be how many words are you intending to write in this session? On the Mac, it seems to me that it's more about how many words is the book going to be? But in either case, you can set a figure and uh, Scrivener keeps track of that. Keeps track of it with a, an icon, a circle that fills out, a line that fills out. So you can see visually how far you've got, or you can actually just see literally the word count of how much you get through. Um, I I suppose if you're doing NaNoWriMo or something, then you might like that for a daily count. I tend to write what needs to be written and then worry about the word count afterwards. What I do with books, with articles, you know you've got so long to do, so it's a bit more on my mind. I might use it then, which I actually had not thought of until I said it to you right now. Word counts and targets, they're all in Scrivener for the iPad, but also Scrivener for the Mac. Actually, let me show you on the Mac the same thing. If I uh, go to draft, I was trying to pick, I think, right, this little um, target symbol, I suppose, oh, it's a target, isn't it? It reminds me of the Apple Fitness icon, that's what I see, and that and it comes with a lot of guilt when I think about that. Target for this document, 60,000 words. I think I've just made that too many, that'll do. And now you can see I'm nowhere near it, at least not in this chapter. Click on the draft. And because that's 11,000 out of 60, see how it's showing me there? I also get a nice little indicator there. I don't actually think this book is going to be 60,000. feels like it's going to come in around 40, but we'll see. Now, I'm not really honestly trying to put off telling you about the compile feature of Scrivener. It's a very important section. It does take a lot of thought. It's going to take me a while to describe it to you. I, I can't, I, that's the end of the process when you're writing, so I want to leave it to the end of what we're talking about. We've talked about everything I know you need for writing, everything I, I believe you need for editing, everything I'm absolutely certain you need for research for it. But Scrivener, it does do a lot of other things. There's a lot of fiddly bits around the, the edges, which um, I think they can be quite confusing if you just dive into all of them. But as you work through, as you develop your projects, as you find what suits you, there are these little extra nuggets that can be used. I mean, for example, um, within Scrivener, you could do a Wikipedia search. I, I don't. I wouldn't do that because I'm on a Mac or I'm on my iPad. Safari is next to me. Command Tab, and I'm into Safari. I'm doing the Wikipedia search. I might then drag the Wikipedia result into my research folder, Scrivener. But I, I wouldn't personally happen to search Wikipedia within Scrivener. But you can, Wikipedia, Google, all sorts of things you can do. I want to show you just one of these little nice extras. Unfortunately, this nice extra is only on the Mac, but just as an example of the fact that there's always something more in Scrivener to find. If I look under the Edit menu on the Mac, go down here, there's a Writing Tools section. And look, there's Searching. I'm not even sure what linguistic focus is. I will let that, if, you're, if you tend to overuse adjectives, I think that's a tool for helping you spot that. But this is what I'm interested in, just because I like the idea that it's in there, a name generator. Let's just bring that to the middle of the screen where you can see it. Okay, uh, I want a woman. I don't want alliteration. Double barrel surnames. Okay, um, I don't know. Uh, set a forename. Starts with, well, I'm William. Let's start with a W. So surname starts with, no, ends with, what would be a good, well, G for Gallagher at the ending. Obscurity level, oh, I love this. I've no idea what's going to happen now. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Catalan, 
Now, you could spend an hour in this. It's fantastic. You don't have to do any writing at all. Let's generate some names. Wendy Wong Reddy. Whitney Kipling Gunther. I think that's a crook, don't you think? The international jewel thief comes to mind. Uh, Wanda Fielding Chelney. I, I'd trust her with my divorce settlement papers or something. Where did my mind go for that? Pick a name, there you go. Use it or don't. It's a, it's a nice little extra. And one of the reasons to tell you is because there are all these extras. Another one is I only just found it the other day. And I really like it just for the, the level of fun of detail in it. Writing is such a serious thing, isn't it? That's what we want, really serious writing tools. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Oh, you're looking at me. Yeah, it's time to compile. Well, look, you can see it in my face and you've definitely heard it in my voice. Have I made you worry about compiling? Have I put you off this omen? I shouldn't really. The thing is, Scrivener's kind of had two reputations throughout the years. One is that it is fantastic for writers like you and me. It's really good for everything we do when we're writing. The other reputation has been more that it's um, murder, really, to do this last section, this compile bit, and that is not entirely fair. Also, it's got better in the last few years. I don't want to say that uh, it's compiling is as complicated as you want to make it, but it, it kind of is. Uh, understand first what compile actually does. There's your book in Scrivener with all of these chapters, and you know you can read one, you can read two of them. When you want to finish up and you're sending your book to a publisher, an editor, or you're publishing it yourself, you want one document maybe a Word document, maybe a PDF. You tell Scrivener that. You say, compile all of these into one document, please. And it does it. Actually, if that's all you want to do, compile it into Word to send to your editor, make it into a PDF to send your publisher, well, that's really easy. And actually, that's not quite all I do. I do one more thing. I do those two, but I will also tell uh, Scrivener to compile it into an ebook format because I can then chuck it on my iPad or onto a Kindle and read there. Again, that's quite simple. Where it starts to get complicated is if you do want to control more of the final look. I don't. If I'm publishing a book myself, then I will take the text from Scrivener and I will put it in uh, Adobe InDesign, in uh, Affinity Publisher or uh, an ebook app like ebook and print app like Vellum, and I will worry about the look of it there. And of course, then when I'm sending it to a publisher, well, let them worry about the look of it. I usually only care about the text. Those times when I'm more fussed about it or when you need to be more in control of every little detail, that's where compile gets complicated because it's so much detail. Any one part of it, doddle. You can handle all of it. It's the many, many combinations of choices that are the problem. So for example, if you were doing a book, you can set at the compile stage, what the font should be, unsurprisingly. You can set what the headings are, what font, what layout, what size, um, I think where the page numbering begins, all this. You can set what's the front matter of the book, so what's the title page so it doesn't have a page number, what's the body copy so it does. You can set where the chapters always begin on the right-hand side as they should. You can set a thousand different details. But the thing with it all, well, it's kind of, there's two things. There's a, a goodish thing and a nice-ish thing. The goodish thing is whatever you choose of all of these options, you're going to end up with a document at the end. Something is going to be compiled and output. It's going to be a PDF document, a Word, or whatever it is. You can then open it. And if it looks rubbish, well, then you go back through those options and you tick and you untick what you want and you try it again and again. I've iterated around... 40 times to get something what I wanted, which is possibly a demonstration of how rubbish I was at it, more likely a demo of just how many myriad options there were, options and combinations of options. That's the goodish thing, that you can see the results and you can go back and make changes until you get it right. The nicest one is that actually things are a lot better than they used to be, and that's the iPad's fault. Several years ago now, Scrivener came to the iPad, and it's not what's called a port, where they take the app and they push it onto another machine and make it fit somehow. Uh, it was rewritten for the iPad. 
And also, because you know, it's a big job writing for a new machine, to get it out at all, they didn't put absolute, absolutely every Scrivener feature in there. They just put all of the writing ones, most of the compile ones, but not all of them. It's a new compilation engine, and it tended to have the most common options. And that actually meant for quite a while, Scrivener on the iPad was much easier to use at this stage than Scrivener on the Mac. So much so, that Scrivener on the Mac kind of adopted this. All of the power that was on the Mac version of Scrivener, it's still there, but because it tends to be stuff you only need when you know you need it, it's slightly pushed back, slightly further away. You have to go looking for it slightly more. The defaults, what gets shown to you straight away, is similar to how easy it is on the iPad. Um, and I really think that's an improvement in Scrivener. Everything you've heard of me being a bit ominous about it is from years of how it used to be, not the year or two of what it is now. I should say, by the way, everything you just saw there, and especially actually all of the iPad stuff, that can be done on your iPhone too. Also Windows, actually, there's, there's nothing to stop you writing in a Scrivener book on a PC as well as on Applegate. And I should say, that everything you just saw must make you think Scrivener is going to be really expensive. I'm obviously hiding the price to the end. No, it's $49 for the Mac. And uh, although the company is based in the UK, it sells in US dollars. So that's $49, which today in the UK is roughly the equivalent of £36. And the iPad, the iPhone version together, is $20 or the equivalent of £15. How many years if I've been using both of these apps. What's the, the, the rate per day? What's the rate per word of paying for Scrivener? Scrivener pricing is practically ridiculous. So let's go exploit it and write some books or scripts. That's it for this uh, special edition of 58 Keys, this three biscuit guide to Scrivener for the Mac and the iPad. Thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourself, write more, and I'll see you soon.